We're going to be taking a look at a lot of various passages this morning, but uh, primarily uh, we'll spend some time in Luke 17, Mark 7, and Ephesians chapter 2. Um, so if you want to kind of mark those as to where we'll be here this morning. We have uh, been going through a series called, we don't talk about that, just trying to cover some various topics, uh, both biblically uh, in terms of, of texts that just don't get touched very often, like Leviticus or Obadiah. Um, I think there was one time in my life I didn't even know that the, the book of Obadiah even existed. Um, and so, you know, there's just texts that we don't touch very often. Um, another text that doesn't get touched very often, Jude. Anyone know what Jude's about? <laughs> you go read it, there's some strange stuff in there. Michael fighting over the body of, of Moses and things. Like, it's, it, there's some things to ponder about there. And, like, you're wondering, what in the world does that mean? But we've also touched on some topics uh, that don't often get talked about. And sometimes I don't talk about them very often, like uh, giving and things. Uh, I don't really talk about money much from, from uh, this position. And so we tackled that topic a couple weeks ago. Uh, we've talked about justice and... Uh, just a bunch of different topics. And this morning, uh, another topic that, that, you know, some churches are talking about a little bit more often than other churches, uh, but something that's still, I think, in our circles, fairly rare to talk about uh, and think about biblically, and that is foreigners and strangers. Uh, this has been a pretty hot topic in our country and our culture today for quite some time uh, with various uh, presidential leaders that we've had, having some different opinions on how to address uh, some of the issues of immigration and border control uh, and the like. And so we come on this topic to kind of look at what is God's perspective? What is God's view? What does God think about foreigners and strangers? And for us, learning about what God says and what character he reflects towards foreigners and strangers, there's an opportunity for us to realize what God thinks and what God has to say and how, what God uh, feels about foreigners and strangers. And it's his people who are supposed to be representatives of who he is in this world and reflecting his character. Hopefully we might be challenged some this morning about our attitudes and our uh, views and how they might be able to be more aligned to uh, the God of the universe. And so as we go through our study this morning, we're going to see that God cares for the foreigner and stranger. And that he desires people to show them hospitality and love. And so before we dive in, let's go to the Lord and ask him to be with us this morning um, as we study. Father, we thank you for our time together to be in your word. And Father, this is just one aspect of our worship. We sing, we pray, we fellowship, hugging one another, saying hi to one another. And so we're thankful for our entire time together. As we come to your word, it's your word that has power. It is your word that is sharper than any double-edged sword. And so we pray that you will use your word in our hearts and minds, that you will transform us. And that as we walk out here, this building this morning, that we might be able to reflect and be challenged. That that transformation will have its work, that we'd be more like you. So be with us, we ask. It's in Jesus' name, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we pray. Amen. Well, with a lot of these various topics, we, we always start at the beginning. We want to start in Genesis 1 and 2 and take a look at creation. And this hasn't been something that I've been trying to, um, like, burden us with over and over, or like I'm starting to get repetitive to the point of, you know, maybe tuning me out. It's important that we have a proper understanding of creation, because creation sets the design for how God desires his world to be. And of course, Genesis 3 introduces 
rebellion, chaos, anarchy, and it's through those means that our world, God's creation, has been corrupted, that we have misused and abused the position and authority that the Creator has given to humanity. And so everything is kind of marred. It's kind of dulled at Genesis 3. And then the plan that God in Acts, starting in Genesis 12, working through the nation of Israel, and then turning and, uh, or pivoting and turning to work in Jesus Christ to bring salvation, to bring back the garden. And when you get to the end of Revelation, what do you ultimately see? You see a re-envisioned garden. So almost at the every, of every issue, the foundation in a lot of ways is Genesis 1 and 2. It's creation. And so we start there again this morning because in the garden at creation, there were no strangers. There were no foreigners. And that's not just a practical idea. It's a theological idea because obviously there's just two people. So, of course, Adam and Eve are going to know one another. And then there's Cain and Abel and Seth and some family members. Of course, they're going to know one another. There's not going to be strangers. But the theological importance is, is that when God brings Eve to Adam, Adam's response is, you know, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She's not a stranger. He is, she is someone that Adam knows intimately. She's a part of him. And so the theological idea presented in Genesis is, again, mutuality, which means that they're not strangers. They don't become strangers until Genesis 3. Because it's in Genesis 3 when they eat the fruit from the tree, what happens? They see one another, and now what do they see? They see strange things. They see differences. And they're ashamed. And so they try to hide those differences. They're now estranged people. Yes, they know one another. Adam knows Eve and who she is and why she's there. And, and Eve knows Adam and why he's there and who he is and all these different things. So we're not talking about the practical idea of knowing one another. But looking deeper at the theological idea that's presented. They were mutual equals they intimately knew one another. Nothing separated them. There was only pure unity between them. And then when they ate of the tree, that collapses. They're now estranged from one another. So estranged from one another that they decide to try to cover their bodies up. And ultimately, God satisfies uh, that desire for covering through animal skin. So it's something that becomes permanent. It's, it's not something that just simply happened in history, but it communicates largely that humanity is now estranged from one another. From this point forward, there's going to be strangers. There's going to be foreigners. People who are different, look different, sound different, do things differently. But at the beginning, there was none of that. Now, people might have done things differently. You know, Adam might have tried to uh, pick berries off of a tree or a bush or something in a certain way. And Eve might have been like, no, that's not the best way to do it. There's a better way. Let me show you. You know, things that still happen today. But the relationship between Adam and Eve is broken. They're now estranged from one another. As we venture further along in Genesis, we come to Genesis chapter 11, which creates even more estrangement, even more separation, really bringing the idea of foreigners. In Genesis chapter 11, humanity gathers together. The picture that Genesis 11 gives us is that, that all of humanity is together in one place. Again, an act of disobedience, because what did God say? I want you to be fruitful, multiply. I want you to spread over the earth. But what are they doing? They're coming together. And strangely enough, by Genesis chapter 11, you come to realize that God is absent. He's absent from the chapter. In, in, terms, of, in terms of his involvement or his, his name or his presence among the people. Obviously, it's a, it's a narrative story and God has talked about and mentioned. But in terms of what the people are doing... 
God is absent. Because they're coming together to build a city for themselves, to build a tower that will reach into the heavens so they can do what? To make a name for themselves. There's no concern for God's name or for who he is. He's completely forgotten. And so God, in the, in the narrative, kind of speaking out loud, he comes down to see what humanity is doing on earth, and he sees them gathering together to build this great city. He says, can't have this, because if they're going to continuously work together like this, nothing will be impossible for them. And there's a lot of theological Ideas to unpack in that, but we don't have time for that this morning. And so he comes down and he what? He confuses their languages. And through those languages, the people now scatter. Truly setting the stage for this idea of foreigners. And the biblical view of a foreigner is someone who is estranged. Someone who's not like the rest of us. So as Israel develops its history, as we go through the text of Genesis and Exodus, we find a very, very interesting moment. In Genesis chapter 12, God establishes his plan to rescue the world. He comes to an unknown person named Abram. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will, uh, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Do you understand what God has just done? God has gone to this gentleman named Abram. Nothing special about him. He's living in the land of Ur in his father's household and God just speaks to him. He comes to him and says, hey, I want you to leave all of this. I want to leave your land, your family, and I want you to go to a land that I will show you. God's plan of salvation begins by taking a guy named Abram and making him who? A foreigner. I'm going to take you from all your stuff and I'm going to take you to a land that is not your own. You're going to be a foreigner. You're going to be a stranger in this place. And as you read through, um, as you read through uh, Abraham's story, he comes uh, to that place. And uh, in that place, he um, is most definitely seen As a foreigner, Genesis chapter 17, verse 8, God recognizes Abraham as a foreigner and makes him the promise that he will one day not be a foreigner. He says, the whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner. So God recognizes what he's he's caused Abraham to become. Again, in the ancient world, to be a foreigner is to be a marginalized individual. He's left his support system. He's left his family. He's left his wealth. He takes only what is his on an incredibly long journey. Coming into a land with strange people, strange language, strange customs. All of this is foreign to Abraham, and he is going to stick out like a sore thumb. He's going to be in this land, and he's going to look different. He's going to speak different. He's got to take time to learn their language. And usually when foreigners come into someone's territory, people start to perk up and go, okay, what kind of danger is this going to represent? How do I need to defend myself? How much do I need to be concerned about these, this strange person and his possessions coming into my land? Because he's entering the land of the Canaanites. And so as God continues to expand the covenant with, with uh, Abraham in Genesis 17, God recognizes that to Abraham, you are a foreigner. I have made you a foreigner. I brought you to a strange land among strange people. Where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. And I will be their God. 
So God says, right now you're a foreigner, but I'm going to make you a resident. Where you stand, this land will be your land, and so it will be your home. You won't be a foreigner anymore. And your people, your descendants, they won't be foreigners anymore. This is the promise that God gives to Abraham. Later on in verse 12, the covenant sign includes foreigners. Okay, so God enters into a covenant with Abraham. He says, to you, Abraham, I'm going to have a special relationship. I'm going to give you promises. And through those promises, I'm going to bless the whole entire world, all the nations. And that includes other people. Because listen to this, chapter 17, verse 12. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. Okay, circumcision was the sign that you belonged to the promise. And later on, as, as uh, Abraham's family develops into the nation of Israel, uh, God expands that promise and says that circumcision is the sign that you belong to my people, that you belong to my family. And that's the whole mess, New Testamently, that Paul gets into all these other Jewish Christians going along. Well, if, in order for you to be part of God's family, you need to be circumcised. And Paul's like, no, people inherit the, Abraham promi- or the promise of Abraham through faith and grace. And so that's a New Testament controversy. But what I want us to see is what comes next. When they're eight days old, they must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Now again, the specifics have to do with bringing in someone that's been bought. But nonetheless, What God is saying is that as these foreign people that you buy from foreign people, as you bring them into your household, they must receive the mark. They must be circumcised. Why? Because they are a part of my people. They belong to my family. So make sure they receive the sign of the promise. Genesis 21, verses 23, the treaty between Abraham and Abimelech. Uh, The king here recognizes Abraham as a foreigner. Now swear to me, here before God, that you will deal, uh, that you will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. Show to me in the country where you now reside as a foreigner the same kindness I have shown you. So here's Abimelech. Abraham's moved into Abimelech's land. Abimelech recognizes Abraham as a foreigner. And he wants to have this treaty between Abraham and his people. So, the big idea with Abraham here is, is that God is using a foreigner to start his plan of salvation. A foreigner. Well, as time goes on, Israel or Abraham's family turns into the nation of Israel. And so now God, through Moses, is going to have some instructions on how Israel treats these foreigners. First of, all, first of all, let's take notice that Moses himself at one time was a foreigner. When he leaves Egypt, when he runs away, he goes, to a, he goes to the land of Midian and he marries. And he names his son Gershom, which means I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Exodus 2.22, Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Moses himself is recognizing God's blessing and provision and recognizes his status. He's a foreigner. He's not where he belongs. Isaiah 56 verse 3. Oh, excuse me. So Moses here is saying that he's a foreigner and he was welcomed in a foreign land. Continuously, God includes foreigners in his family, just as we saw with Abraham, Exodus 12, uh, verse 48, which I don't have written down. Missed that one. Exodus 12, verse 48. A foreigner residing among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his household circumcised. 
Then he may partake. Or then he may take part in like one born in the land. No uncircumcised male may eat it. The same law applies both to the native born and to the uh, foreigner residing among you. So here God is giving provision for all the foreigners that are among the Israelites. That if they want to partake in this Passover meal, if they want to be people who are rescued, then they need to be people who partake in the sign of the covenant with Abraham. They need to be circumcised. In other words, they need to become part of God's family. So here, God's extending uh, the boundaries of his family to foreigners. Isaiah 56, verse 3, Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. Here Isaiah expresses that that foreigners should have confidence that if they have bound themselves to God, if they're devoted to God, they don't need to worry in any way that God is going to reject them. They've been fully accepted as God's people. So God includes foreigners in his family. We also see that God instructs Israel to have compassion and love for foreigners. Exodus chapter 22 verse 21. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner. For you were foreigners in Egypt. And similarly in chapter 23, verse 9 of Exodus, do not oppress a foreigner. You yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners because you were foreigners in Egypt. I love this. I love how God is telling Israel, I want you to not mistreat these people because I don't want you to lose sight that you too were once foreigners. You know how this feels. So treat them well. Treat them with compassion and love. Leviticus 19, verse 34. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. When Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says to love God with all your being. And he follows that up saying that the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That comes from Leviticus 19. Uh, as well. And what do we see? We see God extend that same command of loving their neighbor, not just to the native born, not just to those who are like you, but also to the foreigners, to the Ethiopians, to the Egyptians, to the Assyrians, the Babylonians, whoever these people might be. And for whatever reason why they're among you, living in your nation, you are to love them as yourself. Why? Because you were once foreigners in Egypt. Deuteronomy 10, verses 18 and 19. He defends the cause. This is God, uh, Moses, speaking to the Israelites before they go into the promised land. And he reminds them, this is what God thinks of foreigners. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. So God is constantly going back. Remember this time when you were in Egypt? That's where you were a foreigner. You know how it is to live as a foreigner, to be treated as a foreigner. I don't want you to treat people the way that you were treated by the Egyptians. I want you to love them. Because why? You were foreigners and because God has a love for them. And God loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. God is all about taking care of them and providing for them. He loves them. Psalm 146, verse 9, The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. God has a passion. He has a love for those who are out of place. Now, in a lot of ways, the way we understand the word foreigner is ethnicity, someone who doesn't belong to our nation. But that's not the only way to understand the word foreigner in Scripture. It can be understood, and it should be understood, to expand beyond just ethnic, but also socially. Those who are different. Different practices, different beliefs, different languages, different skin colors, 
God's saying that he loves the foreigner, those who are different. He provides food and clothing for them just as he does for his own people that he's chosen, the people of Israel. And the psalmist reminds us that God watches over the foreigner along with others and he frustrates the ways of the wicked. And so we see rooted in God's character a compassion and love for foreigners. We see also that forgiveness extends to foreigners as well. As you read through Deuteronomy and Numbers, it is constantly repeated. When God gives instruction about how he has removed the sin of the people through the sacrifices that they bring at the tabernacle, the majority of the time there's always a comment including the foreigner. That they are people who also receive the same forgiveness. And God wants to remind them, also his people Israel, to treat foreigners fairly. Deuteronomy 1.16. And I charge your judges at that time, hear the disputes between your people and judge fairly. Whether the case is between two Israelites or between an Israelite and a foreigner residing among you. Don't take advantage of the foreigner. Because again, foreigners usually come to uh, a nation, what? Impoverished, without much. And so they're not going to have the standing, the status. They're not going to have the wealth. They're not going to have this stuff that is going to ultimately give them a fair trial in their context. And so God reminds Israel, when you judge between an Israelite and a foreigner, do it fairly. Do it fairly. Malachi chapter 3 verse 5. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and uh, uh, perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. Do, uh, but do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. Malachi, the close of the Old Testament. This time where, where God is kind of going to go silent for about 400 years. He's coming to Israel and say, people... You're starting to inhabit the practices of those who were before you and resulted in exile. And so God, through Malachi, is coming to the people of Israel and says, I'm going to put you on trial. I'm going to find you guilty of these things. So it's a plea through Malachi to stop, to turn from these wicked ways. And again, we see foreigners among the people listed that God cares about. He desires to see them have justice, to be treated fairly. Well, as we come to the New Testament, we have Jesus coming face to face with 10 lepers. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Jesus heals these lepers. There's only one who gives praise to God. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, okay, so ten people, one of them, When he saw that he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan, a foreigner. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The foreigner is the one who seems to recognize the gift that Jesus gave and has the appropriate response. The foreigner, the outsider, is the one who understands Jesus more than the others. We see Jesus have a lot of interaction with foreigners, people outside of Israel. One of my favorite moments is the Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7. Verse 24 through 30, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. This is Gentile land. This is, this is foreigners. 
He entered, the house, uh, he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as, he heard about, when, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children uh, eat all that they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Jesus gets a little derogatory here. It's kind of a shocking moment. Like, it's not expected. Jesus, you know, he shows kindness. He treats people with dignity and respect. So why in the world would he all of a sudden have this derogatory term towards this Syrophoenician woman? So it's an interesting moment that, that he has this derogatory moment. And basically the idea that Jesus is communicating here to this woman, and if you read the other Gospels, she's actually being consistent, and the disciples actually find her sort of annoying, and they try to send her away. And Jesus actually seems to be a little bit annoyed, and maybe this is the reason for the derogatory term, because he's trying to like send her away. Like, I'm trying to rest. I'm trying to escape. I don't want to be bothered right now. And in fact, Jesus here in Mark is making the emphasis that my mission is to Israel. They're the ones who are to receive this message. They're the ones who are supposed to get it and respond to it. Not you Gentiles. You know, for us who get to see the big picture already because of the whole New Testament, that's, that's for later. They're going to get it later. But this woman is most certainly persistent. And she responds, then he, uh, Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. In other words, she communicates, this message is just as much for me. You are just as much for me as your own people are. She gets who Jesus is. And so Jesus responds, and then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found her child laying on the bed and the demon gone. A foreigner, an outsider understands Jesus. If you kind of know the cultural dynamics, um, this scene comes to life a little bit. Uh, especially as you read the other Gospels. Because what's going on here is, again, the disciples are trying to keep her away from Jesus. Like, she's unworthy. She's, she's a, a Gentile. She's going to defile them. She's going to defile Jesus. Like, just, just go away with your problems. They're not our concern. And Jesus kind of jumps in a little bit on that. Like, yeah, the message is for Israel, not for the dogs. And the disciples are probably going, all right, Jesus, yeah. Yeah. That's a, great, that's a great comment. Way to put her in her place. And then she responds so profoundly that Jesus is like, yes. Yes, you understand the message I have. You understand who I am. Your daughter's healed. And the disciples are probably going, what in the world just happened? Why did he do that? He, he was doing everything that we expected him to do as a good Jew. And now all of a sudden he's not. Why would he help this Gentile woman? Because she understands who Jesus is, the message of the kingdom of God that he brings, and he heals her. Well, Jesus continuously interacts with other foreigners. The woman at the well in John chapter 4, she's a Samaritan, she's an outsider. The Roman centurion in Matthew 8, it's a Roman, he's a Gentile. But he heals his daughter. Legion. Again, Jesus adventures into Gentile territory on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And among them, they find this madman among the, the, the cemetery. He's got super strength. And when Jesus talks with this gentleman who's a Gentile, he talks to Legion. And yes, there's more a focus on Legion and the things going on there. But nonetheless, ultimately, the person who Jesus healed was a Gentile, an outsider, a foreigner. When you take a look at Jesus' lineage, there are two prominent foreigners in his family history. You have Rahab, you have Ruth. Foreigners whom God orchestrated to bring into his family to bring about the Savior of the world. Why would God do that? 
Exactly the reason that he communicated to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy. God loves foreigners. Now, to go all theological on this idea, not just practical, that maybe as God's people reflecting his character, we need to have the same attitude, that we would be people who would love the foreigner, which is going to impact how we think, it's going to impact our attitudes concerning our own crises right now with the foreigners who are coming to this country. So not only should we have God's character and love those whom he loves, but remember back where God in Deuteronomy and Exodus, where he told, when he told the Israelites, I want you to treat the foreigner well. Why? Because you were foreigners once. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done by the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Remember, that's where you were. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, uh, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in the flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself a new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, okay, so what has Christ done? He's created, and again, this is along ethnic lines, Jew and Gentile. God has completely destroyed that dividing line, that barrier, that wall between Israel and foreigners is completely wiped out through Christ. So consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple to the Lord. In him, you two are being built together, become a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. So again, there's two things going on. There's the theological idea that you as Gentiles were separate from God. You are not inheritors. We, I should say we, I'm a Gentile. We are inheritors. We are not the inheritors of Abraham's promise. Israel is. And Israel is God's people. But God, or Paul says, but Christ has done away with all that. You who were at a distance, we are now close. Why? Because God has created a new humanity where there is no foreigner anymore. Guess what Jesus has done then? He's brought about the garden again. There's no foreigners. There's only unity and oneness. There's mutuality. There's no more estrangement. Everyone is a brother and sister in Christ. And again, this goes beyond just uh, the context of the idea of, of nationality. Paul here is talking specifically to the Ephesians about ethnic lines. But it expands beyond that. Includes anyone who's different in any way. So we see that we were once foreigners to God, but we have been brought close. We have been brought together with God's people into a new humanity that is all of these different people. Social class, rich or poor, male or female, slave or free, 
Jew or Gentile, these borders don't matter anymore because we're no longer foreigners to one another. We're no longer estranged to one another. We're the family of God now. And for those who still sit far off, because again, he's talking to a church, so these people are people who have given their loyalty, faith, and trust in Jesus Christ. The character of God still stands. So those who stand outside that family, who are still yet estranged, guess what? Love them as we love ourselves. We need to love them as we love ourselves because God loves the foreigner. So what? Well, as God's people, we should reflect God's character. What's God's character? God loves the foreigner. He wants to see them treated well. He wants to see them loved. He wants to see them provided for. That's God's character. So no matter the person that you come in contact with, we should always love them as we love ourselves. If that be an ethnic foreigner, you know, those from down south crossing over the U.S.-Mexican border, we should have love for those people. We should provide for those people in some way. Now, again, Scripture doesn't dive into all the various dynamics of legality, you know, what's legal, what's not legal. Scripture's view is that that might be important on a civil level. What is important is your attitude, your love, your compassion for them. If they're here illegally or legally, does it matter? They're here, we're called to love them, to care for them, and to treat them well, because God loves the foreigner. So taking this information, it's going to take some effort, some time to dwell and uh, meditate on God's character and what it means and how it impacts what we might think socially and civically. Nothing wrong with petitioning the government with what you believe the government should be doing. But it needs to be in line with God's character. And ultimately, what is our heart attitude. What is our attitude towards those people who are created in God's image, whom God loves and cares about? And again, this is not, this not limited to our borders. It's not limited to ethnic lines. There are a lot of different people in this world that from us. Do we love them as we love ourselves? Do we treat them well? Because God loves the foreigner. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning and the challenge of your word. You have a great love for those who are on the fringes. You love the foreigners. And you desire your people to love them as we love ourselves. To show dignity and respect compassion and humility. And so, Father, if our hearts are in the wrong place, convict them. May our attitudes change. And with our attitudes changing, may our actions change. You love people. Let us not have these boundaries of class, gender, ethnicity. These these boundary markers have been obliterated by Christ. So may we not get hung up on them. May we find unique ways to balance our beliefs and views. There is something to be said about doing things the right way, the legal way. Help us to have compassion and love in those ways. Father, we thank you. Continue to work in our hearts and minds, transforming us to be more like you. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.